Well, this morning we are starting a new series called Bless, the gospel for everyday life. And regardless of where you are at in your journey with Jesus, we're so glad that you chose to join us this morning. And we believe that God has a word for you throughout this series. And just a little um, fun fact about me, um, in the two and a half years that Marty and I have been at Community Covenant, I have never preached the first message in a series. Marty has always preached the first message in a series, and here's why. While Marty and I share the gift of teaching, um, that's about where the sharing of our gifts ends. Um, if you've been around Marty, you know that he's a visionary, and we like to joke about how he's always at 30,000 feet. And I am the details person. And so while he's at 30,000 feet casting vision for like five years down the road, which is awesome, we need people like that in our churches to be looking down the road at what we hope to see God do in and through us. I'm over here like, hello, we still need to do today. Um, and, and what are the steps that we need to take to get there? And so when it comes to message series, that first message in a series is casting the vision for where we're going to go for the rest of the series. And I have not had that confidence to do that because, again, that is more Marty's gifting. And so I pray the Holy Spirit gives me what I need and equips me to do what he's called me to do in the midst of this message this morning because that's actually what we're talking about is the empowering of the Holy Spirit in and through us to equip us to do what God has called us to do. If you're here this morning as one who is walking with Jesus, it's likely that you know that you're called to proclaim the gospel in your everyday life. And you've, you do not know that, you know now. That is a calling that we've been given. Hopefully that is your desire and hopefully you are taking steps every day to be used by God on mission. Hopefully you want to help others discover the same truth, this new life that's available to each one of us that you have discovered. Hopefully you recognize that your life has been changed by Jesus and that you so desperately want other people in your life to have what you have. Through this series, we want to dive into God's word and discover what he says about sharing the hope and the promise that we have. And what it means to recognize that we've been blessed not to simply keep it to ourselves, but to bless the lives of others in a very real way. That points them to the love of the Father, the empowering of his presence through the Holy Spirit, and the reality of new life in Jesus Christ. So over the course of the next five weeks leading up to Easter, we'll unpack five simple practices that you saw on the bumper video. And we want to invite you to engage with them right where you live, work, and play. Our hope is that as we interact with our friends and neighbors and co-workers over the next few weeks and beyond, that we will be used by God to help them take one more step in their journey towards Jesus and surrender their lives and hearts to him. We believe that as you seek to authentically bless others daily, that God will use you to further his kingdom. This morning, I want to invite you to turn with me to John chapter 17. John is the fourth gospel in the New Testament, and it's sandwiched in between Luke and Acts. If you brought a Bible with you this morning, um, I invite you to turn with me there. Otherwise, there's a Bible provided for you under your chair, your neighbor's chair. If you're joining us online, we hope you will grab a Bible and be in God's word with us this morning. John was one of the 12 disciples of Jesus, and he wrote a firsthand account of Jesus' life in ministry in the Bible. In chapter 17, John is capturing the prayer that Jesus prays to the Father in the final hours of his life before he goes to the cross to die. This is Jesus' longest prayer in the Bible. And we're also given a glimpse into his heart and soul as he cries out to God in the presence of his disciples. Let's begin reading in verse 1. After Jesus said this, he looked toward heaven and prayed, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son, that your Son may glorify you. For you granted him authority over all people, that he might give eternal life to all those you have given him. Now this is eternal life, that they know you, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I have brought you glory on earth by finishing the work you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your presence with the glory I had with you before the world began. 
I have revealed you to those whom you gave me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have obeyed your word. Now they know that everything you have given me comes from you. For I gave them the words you gave me, and they accepted them. They knew a certainty that I came from you, and they believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those you have given me, for they are yours. All I have is yours, and all you have is mine. And glory has come to me through them. I will remain in the world no longer, but they are still in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, protect them by the power of your name, the name you gave me, so that they may be one as we are one. While I was with them, I protected them and kept them safe by that name you gave me. None has been lost except the one doomed to destruction so that scripture would be fulfilled. This prayer is broken into a few sections. And as Jesus begins his prayer, he's acknowledging before God that he accomplished the work that God sent him to do. Jesus' entire career, if you will, was focused on glorifying God by delivering his message of hope and love to God's people. Although his final actions, his death on the cross and resurrection, have yet to be completed, Jesus has resolved that he will finish this work. And so he acknowledges before God, I have done what you have sent me to do. He's demonstrated who God is to the people. He has given them God's word, and he has brought glory to God's name. Jesus continues his prayer then by expressing his desire for his disciples. And remember, the disciples are right there listening to Jesus pray to God. And as he prays for his disciples, he's also praying for us who have said yes to Jesus. In verse 13, Jesus says, These things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. What Jesus wants for us can get a bit lost in translation. Literally, in the Greek, the text says, so that they may have the pleroma of my joy. What Jesus wants for his disciples and for us is a pleroma, a fullness of joy. He doesn't just want this regular old joy. He wants this overflowing, well-full, abundant joy. Jesus prays that his disciples, including you and me, would experience his pleroma of joy. Not just enough joy to wake up in the morning. Not just enough joy when the sun is shining. Not just enough joy when things are going well and circumstances are great and life is peaches and unicorns. His heart is that we would have the fullness of joy. A joy that overflows and gushes out even in the hardest of times and the darkest of moments. This pleroma of joy is a joy that sustains us through all things. So how do we get this joy? How do we experience this joy in the midst of challenging circumstances? How do we experience this wellful of overflowing, sustaining joy? The answer might surprise you, but it's here in John 17. In order to give this, us this fullness of joy, Jesus sends us out on mission. And he says this later in verse 18, as you have sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. God, as you have sent me, Jesus, into the world, so I am sending them, believers, into the world. And what we're being told here is simple but so powerful. Jesus is saying, I am filled with joy because God sent me to earth to fulfill a mission, and I have accomplished it. And now, as my beloved disciples, I want you to experience this fullness of joy. So I'm going to send you out on mission. And as you go about accomplishing this mission that I have for you, you will experience this pleroma of joy. We experience ultimate joy when we are living into God's mission for our lives. We experience ultimate joy when we're living into God's mission for our lives. It's in the surrender, this empowering of the Holy Spirit of being joined with God on mission that roots us in this pleroma joy. I think if we're honest with ourselves, we often feel like we're lacking joy. We're lacking a sense of purpose. We wonder why it is that we are here. Why did God create me? What is God doing in my life? Is there more to life than this? It might be because we've been living for ourselves. It might be because our focus is on the next bigger and better thing. It might be because we're so busy, we're not even taking time to look around us and see what God is doing. I know I'm so guilty of that. I go about my day 
And at the end of the day, I think, God, what, what happened? Where were you? And the reality is he was there all along. I just didn't pay attention. Our hearts and our souls were made for more than the daily mundane material goods, earthly pleasures. Our lives were designed for so much more than punching a time clock or binging on Netflix or scrolling through Facebook. We were made for mission. But this being on mission approach raises a problem, doesn't it? It means that we have to surrender our wants and our desires and our wish lists that we've created for ourselves. It means we have to turn the focus away from us and towards others. Ten years into parenting our four children, I understand more of the sacrifice involved with putting others' needs first. And if you are a parent or a grandparent, you understand probably what I'm about to talk about. My sleep came secondary to feeding the baby or comforting a toddler who had just had a bad dream. My workout was stopped short because a child got hurt and needed a Band-Aid, and in our house it was probably because they were lifting the dumbbells right next to me. (laughs) The stories that I want to share at the end of the day because I'm an external processor and I need to process out loud, they're put off so that I can listen to my children talk about their day. I no longer have endless money to spend on myself because my children need clothes, shoes, and school supplies. Although Marty would say I probably never had endless money to spend on myself in the first place. (laughs) Friends, this is what it's like to be on mission. You're on mission when your comfort, your convenience, your security are secondary to a larger cause. As a parent, as a grandparent, we automatically put ourselves second when it comes time to our children and our grandchildren. And that is the heart of God for us when we are out in our world. It should come natural to us, automatic to us, to think of others and put others' needs first. When someone or something is more important than our happiness and our needs, we are on mission. When we are living for something beyond ourselves, when we're willing to sacrifice everything, we're on mission. We're on mission when we do these things, and we're not mad or frustrated about it, but rather something alive is in us. We feel that joy, that pleroma joy. Now, I'm not saying there's anything wrong with having a good career, a nice home, the most handsome or beautiful spouse, the perfect children. But if you live only for those things, you're not looking beyond your own needs and desires to the mission that God has called you to be on. If that is your main goal in life, if you finally get there, if you ever get there, there will be an emptiness in your life. If the main goal of your life is to be happy, friends, you'll never be happy. If you think you're the most significant thing in your life, guess what? You'll actually find that you feel more and more insignificant. The time you spent pursuing these hollow aspirations will leave you devastated and joyless because that's not what we were created for. The truth about living in God's backwards kingdom is that we are most alive when we are living for something greater than ourselves. Jesus doesn't send us to the most convenient places with this cushy mission. Rather, he sends us to dangerous and uncomfortable places. He sends us to hopeless and helpless places. He sends us to broken parts of the world where people are hurting and struggling. And maybe you don't notice at this point, but I bet if you pray, God, show me the people in my life who are hurting, and you go to work tomorrow, or you take a walk in the park tomorrow, God's going to show you those people. A life on mission is hard work, and it entails sacrifice. But when we give ourselves to this life of mission, it changes us. It lights up something deep within us, and we begin to feel alive again, yes, in the midst of challenging circumstances. And this is Jesus' joy expressed in John 17. Jesus says that when we live a life on mission, we experience this awesome and overflowing pleroma of joy. Let's continue reading, beginning in verse 14. I am coming to you now, but I say these things while I am still in the world, so that they may have the full measure of my joy within them. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them, for they are not of the world any more than I am of the world. My prayer is not that you take them out of the world, but that you protect them from the evil one. 
they are not of the world, even as I am not of it. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, I have sent them into the world. For them I sanctify myself, that they too may be truly sanctified. I want to pull out two important words in this passage, sanctify and sent. The word sanctify means to be set apart, and sent implies being equipped for a mission. Sanctify means to be set apart, and sent implies being equipped for a mission. And I think if you put those two words together, we can see that Jesus desires to take all of the guesswork out of our calling in this prayer. He wants us to know that as believers, we have been set apart from the world and equipped to take the gospel to the world. We have been set apart from the world and equipped to take the gospel to the world. Now, there's a tension here, right? We're called to live in the world, but if you're only in the world and you're not sanctified, you're not set apart, you'll think and act like the world, and you won't be on mission. But if you're only spending time with Christians, you're not sent, and you'll neglect the mission that God has given you. It's not either or, it's both and. As your pastor, I want to call you to commit to gathering in this space on Sunday mornings, gathering with other believers throughout the week. It is in these spaces that you're encouraged and equipped to go out on mission. But also, as your pastor, I want to call you to commit to being sent out during the other 167 or so days a week to be a witness to your neighbors, your coworkers, and friends. We're called to be set apart, and we're also called to be sent out. The 19th century preacher Charles Spurgeon said, every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. Every Christian is either a missionary or an imposter. And I want you to think, what are you? As a Christ follower, if you proclaim to be a Christ follower, do you consider yourself a missionary here in Omaha, Nebraska? Or are you an imposter? This is strong language, but it carries an important message. Most modern Christians think of a missionary as a person who leaves behind home to do gospel ministry elsewhere. According to this definition, missionaries are a chosen few who give up everything to serve God. But this definition is limited and incomplete, and quite frankly, it's unbiblical. In reality, the scripture makes clear that every follower of Jesus is on mission. And therefore, every follower of Jesus is a missionary. Being on mission is a part of our very identity as a follower of Jesus. Being on mission is our identity as a follower of Jesus. It's not an optional call. It's not the job of a professional. It's our identity. It is unlikely that most of us in this space will be called to pack up our bags, leave our homes behind, and minister in another part of the world. But we don't need to travel throughout the world to be on mission. We can simply walk outside our front door and walk across the street. We can start on mission where we live. Ministry begins in your neighborhood, at your place of work, at your kids' or your grandkids' school. Do you know the people who live on your block? Do they know that you know Jesus by the way that you act and the things that you talk about with them? What about your coworkers? Do they know that you're a follower of Jesus Christ? What about the coffee shops that you frequent, the gym, your favorite restaurants? Start there. It's as simple as that. Begin living on mission right where you are and where God has placed you. Our mission statement is going to come up on the screen Here at Community Covenant, we desire to be a diverse community of missional influencers who are empowered to love God, love others, and make disciples. And missional influencers is not a phrase that you'll commonly hear um, out in the world, but basically what it means is that you as a follower of Jesus are on mission, influencing people right where you work, live, and play. Wherever you are, wherever you spend your days, you are called to be a missional influencer. The majority of us people, we're not called to be missional influencers in Africa or China, but we're called to be missional influencers right here in Omaha, 
Nebraska. When we say yes to following Jesus, we surrender our lives to his way and to his will. And we enter into this relationship with God. We, we get this new life, this life change. When you said yes to following Jesus, Jesus saved you from the power of sin. But he didn't just save you from something. He also saved you for something. When you said yes to Jesus, you said yes to being on mission. And maybe some of you are here and you're like, well, I didn't say yes to that. I just said yes to this relationship with Jesus and I can read the Bible and I can go to church and I can be in my Christian circles, but I didn't say yes to being on mission. And friends, you did. Because you can't have one without the other. If you are walking with Jesus, this is what you said yes to. This is the purpose, the calling on your life. This is what will bring you the utmost, ultimate, pleroma joy is when you are on mission. Being on mission isn't about adding activities to your day. It's about being on mission in the midst of your ordinary days and everyday routines. Your job, your kid's school, your trip to the grocery store, your walk in the park, all of these arenas are your mission field. Friends, I came to Christ because a college student saw his college campus as a mission field. And I'm so grateful that when he came to college, he wasn't just thinking, I am here to get an education and to maybe meet my wife. It wasn't Marty, just to clear that up. But he saw his college campus as a mission field. And I came to Christ because of what he said yes to. Friends, the church doesn't exist just for you. If you think that Christianity is a private matter between you and God, or if you think it's just about um, being in your Christian circles here at church, your community group, whatever that looks like, you haven't encountered the God of the scriptures who calls you into a new community, into a new way of life, and also sends you out to share the good news with the world. Jesus prays here in verse 20 that there will be others who believe in God because... His followers are on mission. There are people out there who are going to know and follow Jesus because of all of you out on mission. If the only time that we talk about Jesus is in this space, we've missed the mark. We've missed our calling. We've missed the very purpose that we are here. We gather here in this space to be encouraged, to be equipped, and then to be sent out, empowered by the Holy Spirit to where we live, work, and play. There's a reason why none of you spend the night here. There's a reason why not all of you work here. God has strategically placed all of us where we are 167 days of the week to be on mission. I want to spend the rest of our time together this morning in Genesis chapter 12, and I invite you to turn there with me. Genesis is the first book of the Bible, and it's where we learn that God creates the universe out of nothing. He breathes life into the first man, Adam. He provides for Adam and his wife Eve in the face of their direct disobedience. He protects and preserves through another man named Noah, even though the deceit and the sin of the world has become so common. And he is about to make his plans known for the full redemption and blessing of eternal salvation through a man named Abram. And this is where we pick up in the story, verses 1 through 3. The Lord said to Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. This promise that God gives to Abraham shows us God's heart. It shows us that God's love has always been for the whole world. His plan was always to offer salvation to all the people in the world. I'm afraid that many Christians think of mission as this add-on to church's work. As though the great commission to go into all the world and make disciples from every nation was an afterthought. It's as if Jesus paused just before going back to heaven and exclaimed, Oh, I almost forgot. I want you to go into all the world now and preach to all the nations. No, there's a reason why these are Jesus' last words to his disciple. 
Because from the very beginning, God's purpose and mission to bless and to save has always had a universal scope, has always been God's ultimate purpose, has always been his plan A. Now, in addition to this, these verses showing us about the heart and the plan and the purpose of God, think about what this principle also teaches us about our own role in the world. Because, friends, these verses weren't just written in relation to Abram. God wasn't just speaking to Abram when he gave him these words. This also reminds us that everything that we have received from God is ultimately to be used for the glory of God and the benefit of other people, especially those who do not yet know him. And all of this has been summarized in the phrase, blessed to be a blessing. I titled this message, Blessed to Bless. Because this idea, blessed to bless, blessed to be a blessing, is one of the most crucial principles in the whole Bible. It teaches us something very basic about God's expectations, not only for Abram, but also for us. This is a fundamental statement of purpose that applies to every follower of Jesus. To be blessed by God is to receive his favor. And this isn't worldly favor. This isn't about the income that you have and the house that you have, the material blessings. But it's about a relationship with Jesus, this sense of purpose in life, a contentment in the midst of challenging circumstances, and the hope of eternal life. The blessing that God gives us are intended to be used and shared with all, beginning with this incredible blessing of salvation from sin, and also all the other good things that the Lord has given us. God's blessings are a means to an end, not the end itself. We are blessed by God to bless others. Let's make this personal for just a minute. Think about your own life. Think about everything that God has given you, all the blessings he has poured out, material or spiritual. I would venture to say that if you went home and you started making a list, you'd be working on that for quite some time. Because the reality is that compared to the world's truly poor, most of us in this room are wealthy beyond what we've ever really thought about or acknowledged. Do we imagine that we have been given all of this simply to enable us to live comfortable lives while so many throughout the world are suffering? Do we really think that God has given us everything that we have so that we can live this cushy life here on earth, to sit in our homes, to be with our families, to go to work, punch the time clock, come home, and continue to be in our homes and enjoy the things that God has given us just for ourselves? Or focus for a moment more on the greatest blessing that we have received, this gift of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. What other gift or blessing can compare to that? Our peace with God, the hope of heaven, just yours to enjoy all by yourself? Or are they something that you and I need to share with those around us? Friends, God blesses us so that we may bless others. We're not simply collectors of God's goodness, but we're rather dispensers of God's goodness out to others. We're not closed-fisted, holding tightly to what we've been given. But Lord willing, we can be open-handed with the things that God has given us, and when he calls us to give, we're obedient to that. Friends, this isn't an easy call, and we see this in Abram's life. And if you read more of his story in chapter or in Genesis, you'll see more of the challenging things that God called Abraham to do. God called him to leave everything that was familiar to him, his family, his homeland, all that was comfortable and convenient. But living on mission, it's not comfortable and convenient. We all leave something behind to embrace God's call on our lives. But this is how we bless others, following in Jesus' footsteps through a life on mission. Jesus says in his prayer in John 17, just as you sent me into the world, so I send them. Just as Jesus made himself a servant, sharing God's message of hope and salvation to the world, and ultimately giving his life. So Jesus sends us out into the world to do the same. Over the course of the next four weeks, we'll be exploring different practical ways of how we can bless those around us. 
When we think about being on mission, it can be very daunting. And that's why we're breaking it down into bite-sized pieces for you. Today, I want to challenge you to simply begin with prayer. Beginning with prayer is acknowledging that God is the one who ultimately draws people to himself through the power of the Holy Spirit. Beginning with prayer is an act of surrender and humility to God. In essence, when we go to prayer, we're saying, God, I can't do this alone. I need your help. Use me to bless the people that I encounter in my daily life. Friends, the reality is that there are people all around us every day who deeply desire to know Jesus. And they may not realize it at the time, but it's in them. They're looking for purpose. They're looking for hope. And we have this to offer them. This morning when you came in, you found a prayer card on your seat. And I want, you, want to invite you to take a few moments this week to ask God to bring to mind people that you know, co-workers, neighbors, friends, who do not yet know him. Write their names down. Hang this card on your fridge or mirror. Use it in your Bible to mark your place in the Bible. And over the next four weeks, we want to be praying for these people that God would use you to give you opportunities to engage with them in a way that is eternally significant. If you are here this morning and you've not yet said yes to the God who loves you with an everlasting love, I want to remind you of the prayer that Jesus prayed in John 17. In that prayer, Jesus prayed for you to know the riches of his love, to join him on mission, and to experience this pleroma of joy. He is calling you to leave your former way of life behind, as God called Abram to leave his former way of life, and to embrace the abundant blessings that he has for you. He loves you, and he died for you. Will you say yes to him? To those of you in this space who consider yourself a Christ follower, being on mission is not an optional call. We are blessed to bless over the next four weeks, as we commit to engaging in these simple ways to be on mission, our hope is that more and more people in this community and beyond would know the pleroma of joy through a life-changing relationship with Jesus. Will you pray with me?